Today, we have on hand three of NASA's top people in battery development, safety, and research. Their designs are flying in space right now. The technology they're talking about today is patented and available for license. And it's all about battery safety. We have Dr. Eric Darcy, the battery technical discipline lead at NASA JSC. Joining him is Dr. Will Walker, battery thermal engineer, and Jacob Darst, their lead mechanical designer. Following their presentation on the technologies, we'll be giving you a little information on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. Before we get started, I'd like to point out to our audience that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. And we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Eric. All right. Thank you, Chip. Let me share my screen. Okay. Well, we're happy to be able to present to you um, uh, the status of our fractional thermal runaway calorimeter. And um, I'll start out uh, with the motivation of uh, why, uh, why we started this back four or five years ago. And, uh, and then we'll get into the, the detailed design, and then we'll get into the results with the battery failure data bank. Um, and then when we couple this uh, calorimeter with uh, high-speed X-ray videography, um, we get some unique insights. And it, uh, it's, uh, we've been able to take advantage of that, and we'll share some of that with you, and then finish up with some take-home messages. So this is a, a big team effort. We're very fortunate to have some very talented folks besides the three of us um, at Johnson Space Center. We, we have a, a bunch of other folks that are helping us. Uh, a lot of interns have been uh, uh, interning with us to keep improving uh, this technology. And uh, we also uh, partner with uh, National Renewable Energy Labs, um, Donald Finnegan in particular, who's uh, leading our experiments at the, the uh, synchrotrons. Um, and then we couldn't do this without uh, partnering with uh, University College of London. Um, Paul Shearing's group, Dr. Paul Shearing's group, has been uh, real helpful in getting us access to those uh, synchrotrons in Europe where they allow uh, battery experiments to, to be conducted, battery thermal runway experiments. And uh, some of the special uh, custom cells that we've been able to uh, get made um, wouldn't be possible without uh, Coolometrics, uh, Joe Turner and Ed Buell, and then uh, Brian Morin and Carl Hu at Soteria Big and providing us with those plastic current collectors that, that uh, I'll be telling you a little bit about. All right. so. Why, why do we need this, uh, this calorimeter? And uh, part of it is, uh, the biggest part is because there's one failure mode, the internal short, that we can't put any kind of positive protection on. We can't put a fuse on it. We can't uh, do, uh, take other measures. So we are zero fault tolerant uh, to that event happening. And we can't screen our way out of it because of the latency uh, nature of it. In other words, these defects that get uh, put into these cells during the manufacturing point um, occur very rarely uh, on the order of one in a million, even with uh, reputable manufacturers that have their processes under control, um, but yet they still do occur. And uh, they occur in a latent fashion such that they won't appear in, during the first few weeks that the manufacturer is forming and aging a cell and screening the cell, uh, but they will uh, demonstrate themselves in field use later on. And that was replicated by Brian Barnett uh, when he was at TIAX back in uh, 2012. Um, he presented this uh, paper, a talk, uh, and was able to sh show that by implanting a nickel particle, really small 50 micron sized nickel particle in just the right place, uh, next to the uh, aluminum current collector of the cathode, 
um, it could then move and form a bridging short uh, with cycling. Uh, didn't know how many cycles it would take to get there. It varied uh, uh, from cell to cell, but it definitely took tens of cycles for that to occur and then thermal runaway would occur. So this demonstrated the fact that uh, this latency p uh, potential is real and you can't just screen yourself uh, out of it at the point of manufacture. So we need to be able to understand it and uh, designers of batteries that want to be safe pretty much have to go with the assumption that it's going to happen and we need to protect the adjacent cells from it to happen so it doesn't cascade uh, from a critical event or a critical hazard to a catastrophic hazard. So we've uh, endeavored to be uh, to try to design batteries that will tolerate a single cell thermal runaway event, but do it and without losing the high performance features of the batteries that we want, the lightweight and low volume. So in order to do that, you know, you need to accurately be able to quantify the amount of heat that's generated during thermal runaway but also the fractional distribution of that heat uh, from the, what's called transferred through the can wall versus what's ejected uh, as the thermal runaway ejecta from the cell. We also want to be able to characterize the types of failures uh, that occur from the cells of venting their ejecta up the top as most cells are normally designed for, but we also want to be able to characterize the bottom vents uh, and if any uh, sidewall uh, or spin groove ruptures occur, and these would be can uh, failures, that can be very detrimental to a battery design. It can defeat a lot of the measures that you put in to be passively propagation resistant. So it's uh, something to, to, to understand. And this uh, calorimeter uh, sought to, to be able to do that. And that's the biggest advantage and, and step forward uh, compared to the prior art, uh, art or accelerated rate calorimetry is a really slow method uh, that's really better at uh, detecting the onset of thermal runaway temperature very accurately, but not uh, giving you a very realistic um, uh, representation of the thermal runaway process because the experiment is so slow. It takes hours, cells vent, and then go in the thermal runaway with many hours in between. Then there's bomb calorimetry. Uh, that just gives you the total heat because everything is in an enclosed chamber. Uh, copper slug calorimetry was done on a scale so you could get the mass of ejecta, mass change rate, and get that information, but you really wouldn't get the total heat. So there's, uh, we saw a definite need for thermal runaway calorimetry that was fractional in its nature to be able to distinguish uh, between this the heat that's transferred through the can versus the heat that's uh, ejected out of the cell. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Walker and uh, to, oh, sorry, to, to Jacob Dars to get into the design, and then Will Walker will then get into the results. Understood. Thank you. Uh, I'll be forward one. I'm John Jacob Darst, and I'm going to be talking about the mechanical design and, and function of the device itself. Uh, go ahead and give me the next slide, please. All right. So I, I'm pretty excited to talk about, uh, be able to present this, this work here, because as Eric was saying, uh, there were no adequate methods for understanding both the total energy split and the, uh, the comparative heat, the output fraction that comes out through the cell can versus the amount that's ejected through the top of the cell. So uh, in order to do that, we have this, this fractional thermal runaway calorimeter. <clears throat> so the way it works is it's broken into a, a number of sections. Uh, there's the cell chamber in the center, and then downstream from that on either side, there's uh, sections that are able to capture, uh, decelerate, and, uh, and cool ejecta as it, as it exits the device, such that we can tally the energy that's transferred from the cell into the device. So it's symmetric, as you can see here, in that we can, uh, for, for a nominal top vent cell, it'll come out one side, but if there's any un, unexpected venting or breaching from the bottom side or an intentional bottom vent on a cell, uh, depending on the design, we need to be able to capture that and quantify that as well. <clears throat> so this is all measured by uh, a pretty big array of, of thermocouples all over the device at points of interest that we can then add together and tally the energy from using MCP delta T, and, and Dr. Will Walker will get much further into detail into how all of that works as well. 
Uh, but in the meantime, like I said, here there's major sections that are the cell chamber and then right out from the cell chamber, an ejecta mating section, uh, followed by an ejecta bore uh, and an exhaust system. So in, in the mating section, we're capturing the jelly roll should it want to eject. The exhaust in the ejecta bore, excuse me, <clears throat> contains the major features for decelerating and cooling the gases as they come out. And uh, the exhaust section allows us to uh, couple this with a vent system to, to get rid of the gases in a toxic environment or to capture the gases for measurement, as I'll discuss all of these things later in a little bit more detail, as well as an insulating case. And as a calorimeter, this thing lives or dies by uh, how well it is insulated in this case. So it is a pretty important part of the system, as well as a, a nice data acquisition system. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so down here at the bottom, you can see a sort of internal view where I've cut away the extra shell of the ejected bore, so you can kind of see what's going on. The picture's a bit small, I, I apologize for that, but uh, we have, as I've said, uh, the, the cell chamber and the downstream sections. Those are the two major sections from that must be separated from one another thermally in order for the, the measurements to make any sense. And as, as such, we have uh, ceramic washers, sort of big ceramic bushings that decouple the system from one another uh, thermally connected by non-metal contact systems and some very long tie rods that go from end to end. So as I've said, maintaining thermal isolation is very, very important. And otherwise, the, the data is fairly meaningless. So let's see. Next, I'll be discussing the, uh, <clears throat> the mating section. Go ahead and click me through, please. Oh, excuse me. First, the cell chambers. My, my apologies. So uh, the cell chamber is, is kind of the heart of the device. So this, this device is primarily designed for cylindrical small format cells with, uh, with the primary cell of interest being the 18650. Uh, but we have also got 21700 and D size format cell capability, as well as a pretty new and pretty novel pouch cell capability uh, that's customizable to whatever size and format of cell that you'd like. The thing about this, this calorimeter in general that I'm not sure I've touched on exactly is that each of these sections, the mating section, the bore and the cell chamber, are modular. They can be fit together with standard orifices that go between the sections. And as such, we have a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, in terms of adapting the system to the needs of, of the, uh, the test at hand. So we can add or remove extra sensors or change the format of the cell, yada, yada, with relatively little uh, change to the system overall. So this, this, these cell chambers all use the same upstream and downstream detecting section, as I've just said. All you need to do to change the cell chamber, as long as it is under five amp hours, which is apparently it's a pretty thumb in the wind estimate for total amount of energy release, because it really depends on the thermodynamics of the cell and the kinetics uh, therein. However, uh, if you assume assume about five amp hours, we can get pretty much anything done without having to move anything but the cell chamber. So, one of the main features of the of the cell chamber is that it has these multifunction ports. Uh, one at the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. You can see in this image, there are two screws that are coming outside of it. Those are the top and bottom of the cell uh, ports. Primarily, they're used for thermocouples in our, in our day-to-day -day experiments, uh, but they don't have to be. There's On the other side, there's one in the, in the very center, and I think there's a picture of it on the next slide, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. Um, and those can be swapped around. You can, you can put a nail penetration or whatever initiation method into any of these three holes that you like or instrument them with any sort of novel sensors as you would desire. One of the other most important things about this cell chamber, and you can sort of see a sneak peek of it on the pouch cell or the top of the pouch cell calorimeter chamber, is that uh, we have these pressure assisted seals that uh, use the gas pressure inside the, the system to actually enhance the, the seal quality without requiring tremendous phase compression seal uh, force. So take me to the next cell, please, or the next slide, please. <clears throat> So there are four major thermal runaway initiation methods that we use with the cell chambers currently. Our primary uh, method of interest is the thermal initiation method, wherein we use four cartridge heaters with 250 watts apiece for a total of a kilowatt of input energy uh, into the cell chamber to rapidly heat it and set off the cell uh, in about a minute and a half. Uh, if we choose to use the internal short circuit device, uh, which, which helps us create a short circuit inside the cell using an implanted device that goes off at about 60 Celsius, we can get this thing to go off much faster and with significantly less uh, excess input energy. 
And as, as we've discovered through, through our testing, it, the trigger method is, is pretty important to determining the, the quality and, and, and also shape of the results. The, the things that you do to the cell affect the results. And as such, it's important for us to have various input methods to, to understand our biasing of the test and how to compensate for it uh, as well. So uh, let's see. <clears throat> that's where the that's where the ISC is very helpful and it reduces the total input energy. Uh, the the nail pen is even better in that it doesn't add any, but it has other sort of concerns about pinning the, the jelly roll in place and other other such concerns. So all of these these initiation methods, like I've described down here, the nail penetration and the laser heating system can be put in through that universal port that I described in the previous slide. So you can you can put in there. I, there are a couple other initiation methods to which I am not yet able to, to discuss, but it's pretty easy to just unscrew and screw in a new system with, uh, again, very little change. So an extremely modular, extremely slim system. Uh, the I guess I'll talk for about 60 seconds on on how the laser works, because it's a sort of novel idea in that it's it's fundamentally a heat based method. But unlike the ISC or an unlike the uh, the thermal system in general, you can you can get away with by having a very, very high flux of energy coming out of the laser end. Uh, you can outcompete diffusion from from the contact surface to the rest of the cell, such that you can locally heat a section of the cell and create a thermal runaway short uh, much faster and with much less input energy. It's it's uh, in an in an attempt to supplement the the uh, usefulness of the ISC or to be able to use alongside it. Next slide, please. So the mating section, as I was saying before, is a section that comes in between the cell chamber and the ejected bore. It, it is important that the system produce field-like failures. Any sort of biasing our system does takes us away from the reality of our results. And as such, in some cases, depending on the, the reaction, the cell will want to open the crimp and, and let the the jelly roll fly out either partially or completely into the next chamber. But this, this mating section allows us to put a grate on the bottom of the, the chamber such that the ejected jelly roll is allowed to, to expand freely and to puff up into whatever size it would like, but not allow it to travel further down the system, which could create clogs or potentially muddy the energy tallies from other components of the system, which will make more sense after we discuss what's going on in the rod and baffle section further down. In, the, in this particular system, you can see here it's partially covered up, but you can see that how the ceramic uh, bushing works inside of here. It's basically nested like a goblet in there, and these pressure assisted seals form the couple between the two systems uh, without requiring face prep. So <clears throat> the alignment protrusion on the left hand side of this mating section in the top image shows how the system itself contains a pressure assisted seal, which has the added benefit of ceiling, but also uh, makes it very, very easy to assemble the system and take it apart on the bench top because everything fits together like Lego blocks and holds itself there. Finally, the, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of iteration on how this system should go together and be taken apart because it is one of the fundamental operations of the system to take it apart and clean it and put it back together every time you run it. And as such, uh, efficiency was, a, was of a top priority. So as such, these tie rods you see in the bottom image that go from left to right uh, contain various features. I won't cover all of them, but to allow wrench clearance, to allow speed in terms of uh, on off here, there's only four fasteners to get the whole system apart on the main sections. And it has self uh, aligning features that make sure that the, the tie rod pairs do not want to escape systems so they're not flopping around. It's very quick, uh, it's very efficient. It's, it's something I'm, I'm quite proud of. The next slide, please. So downstream of the mating section is the ejected bore and baffle set, representing the external and internal components of the section, respectively. On the external section, uh, there is this aluminum tube through which the gases are contained. It is instrumented thoroughly and has these lovely strain relief features for us to get dongles of TCs out to the system cleanly. But it also has these quick disconnection uh, fittings from the exhaust section, as you can see that, that Marmon style clamp on the left hand side, the, the, the bore, and then there's a hinged sh uh, shaft collar that's used to fix the case in place during, excuse me, during uh, x-ray synchrotron runs. 
as we are we are limited to a pretty small viewing window when, when looking through the, the device at a synchrotron facility. And as such, it's it's vitally important that the, that the uh, calorimeter not wiggle around in the case due to the impact or, or kickback from the, the cell explosion. So we hold it securely in place and it can be put in and taken out in just a few seconds. Uh, on the inside of that section, there is this rod and baffle assembly, which is, uh, I would say, the second heart of the device. Very, very critical to its function. And what we have here is a system of plates, baffle plates, that slide into the system with a pretty, pretty nice fit. And they contain holes of various sizes that slowly decrease the porosity as they go through the system, such that the gases are cooled and maintained at a speed as they pass through the system with finer and finer gradations of, of particulate, such that you sort of sort uh, the, the particulates as they come in from very coarse to, to finer before passing through this pack of, uh, this translucent stuff is copper mesh or visualization, visualization of it, in which we have these two TCs standing off inside of the mesh. The, this mesh is also extremely important to the design in that it has such a high surface area and such a high conductivity, but a relatively low mass in comparison. It does a phenomenal job at capturing any sort of uh, liquids or powders or gas heats on the way out of the system and is, is a pretty vital backplate. The, uh, the, the last baffle serves as a standoff to hold the system together. Uh, it re simply rests on, the, on the, the cap that's not shown in any of these images. Uh, but again, it's another feature that's designed for speed and ease. You just slap it together and it's ready to go. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we had to prove to ourselves was that in the system, if we've done a good job, the only thing that should be exiting the system is cool, clean air, correct? But there's always uh, going to be some asterisk at the end of that is how much energy are we losing to this gas and what is the gas? And as the system was in its original configuration, we were unable to answer that question. So to that, we have designed a gas characterization and gas sampling system that uses a, a large pipe here. Uh, this is an early prototype of the system that uses a pipe with a, with a bag in it acting as a septum such that whenever uh, the hot ejected gases are, are pushed into this bag, uh, it sort of everts the bag and acts as like a piston, pushing cool, clean air out the right side of the system. If you cap it off and put a flow meter, then because the system is the, the flow meter is calibrated for cool, clean air, uh, it will behave correctly. You'll get a perfectly accurate flow measurement that is for the total volume of gas that was put in there. And if you put uh, thermocouples inside of the, the hot side, as well as a port to which we connect a... Uh, an evacuated hook bottle such that we can capture and uh, GC or MS a uh, sample of the gas. So we know the composition, therefore we can find heat capacities, we know the temperature of the exit gases, and we know the volumetric and total flow. Uh, and as such, you can completely characterize the amount of energy that's coming out. It is, it is relatively low as we had hoped, uh, but this is a way to understand that completely as well as understanding the toxic hazards and, and any other sort of funny business that's going on in those gases that you or your customer may need to know about. <clears throat> next, uh, next thing. So in summation, this, this thing has been in progress since 2016 and we've made a, a load of updates to it. This is the 11th major generation in, in four years since we started the project. Uh, and it hardly looks the same as it did before. Uh, you can see this, this fun image I have of uh, every generation of calorimeter or major revision of generation since Gen 5, which is when the calorimeter started to resemble what it does now. Uh, and since we started, we've gone to the synchrotron facilities, as Eric mentioned, with Donald Finnegan and, and UCL, a number of times very successfully uh, doing tremendous bodies of work while we are there. Uh, and we have gotten lots of published papers. We have hundreds of successful tests to date. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that we have gone from over a day per test to less than an hour per test, such that many can be done per single day, uh, as well as instead of having to, to repair and fiddle with everything as we did in, in early 17 and in early times like that, uh, the system is bulletproof at this point. If, you, if something breaks, it's, it's strange. So it's, uh, it's come a long way in terms of robustness, reliability, measurement accuracy. We've quadrupled the amount of instrumentation available to us since Gen 5 with our own custom data acquisition system to which we can couple all kinds of uh, fun sensors, depending on what you need. Uh, and 
in addition to that, our, our instrumentation has been totally overhauled with, with lots of quality of life improvements in terms of fast disconnects and highly reliable strain relief, as well as, as I've said, this gas, canal, this gas analysis and new trigger methods that have been developed and are continuing to be developed. And I believe that's the last slide for me. So I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. William Walker. Awesome, thank you, uh, Jacob. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started with the battery failure data bank and the associated analysis. So my role in this has been to process the data to support the thermal design of the calorimeter. And um, you know, believe it or not, we, we, we get a lot of questions on the calorimeter, the re results that we're collecting. And so, uh, what we've done is we've taken all of the results that, that we collect uh, with the calorimeter and compiled it into a resource, a public resource that we're referring to as the, the, the battery failure data bank. Um, and it's in this data bank that, that we have all the total energy yields, fractional energy yields, uh, access to the videos like what Eric is, showing, uh, uh, Eric is playing here on the screen. And he's going to be talking to you more about that here in a little bit. Um, so the calorimeter is... Um, you know, it's compatible with high-speed X-ray videography, so we're, we're, we're doing kind of two types of experiments, right? We're, we're doing FTRC experiments to characterize the external thermal performance, and we're doing uh, these synchrotron experiments to characterize the internal failure mechanisms and phenomena, and, and try to link those together uh, to understand why a cell, cell fails the way that it does. And so, uh, you know, Jacob alluded to it, uh, you can see our calorimeter installed at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility with, with the image on the bottom left and installed uh, it with the picture in the middle uh, at, at the Diamond Light Source Facility in, in the UK. So we've run uh, quite a few experiments, uh, hundreds of these specific types of experiments, and we are compiling the results. So uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please, Eric. So uh, basically, we're compiling them into this resource that we refer to as the Battery Failure Data Bank. And this is developed as a collaborative effort between uh, NASA Johnson Space Center and between our colleague Donald Finnegan at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And what it does is it provides engineers and researchers with data that they need to inform models, data that's been driven by the calorimeter. Um, we have data in there from 18650 format cells, 21700 format cells, and, and D-cell format cells. Uh, data for triggering these cells with three different triggering mechanisms, which Jacob talked about earlier. Um, and additionally, we, we have a variety of power cells and energy cells in there. And why this is important to you uh, at, at a talk like this is because this is going to give you a flavor for the type of results uh, that you can collect uh, when using our calorimeter. Next slide, please. So uh, the system we're using for the battery failure data bank uh, is essentially a two component system. Uh, what we do is we compile our results into a, uh, a, a tabular results uh, into a Microsoft Excel based component. Um, this particular component, the current revision of it has uh, uh, approximately 200 FTRC experiments uh, uh, cataloged in it, uh, experiments conducted between 2017 and 2019. And those uh, experiment links are hyperlinked uh, to a radiographic video library, which is hosted through the NREL YouTube channel uh, for more than 300 of the FTRC experiments that were conducted at the synchrotron facilities during the same time period. So the idea is that you would download this spreadsheet and you could uh, click on the hyperlink and it, it would take you to uh, the radiographic video library. And if you uh, were to go through that library, you would get a feel for the type of data, radiographic evidence you could collect uh, for thermal runaway experiments at a synchrotron. Going through the Excel spreadsheet, uh, you could get a feel for the type of data you could collect uh, if you were to uh, run an FTRC experiment by itself. Um, we expect to make this uh, data bank publicly available by the end of this year, actually. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is to kind of help you understand the power of our results and, and what we're starting to understand about the cells that we're looking at. And so uh, one of the things I'm going to do for you today is to show you results uh, for uh, all three trigger mechanisms uh, for uh, cells that are of three different cell formats, the 18650, the 21700, uh, and the D cell. Uh, and, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use data from the data bank, and we're going to perform a comparative analysis of thermal runaway heat output um, as a function of cell format and trigger mechanism. 
So we can do comparisons based on total energy yield. Uh, or test the test total energy yield. You can do comparisons based on average total energy yield. Uh, we can look at the probability density of total energy yield. Um, you can also look at the fractional energy yield, right? Eric hit on that earlier in, in the presentation, right? And this is critical to our calorimeter it, it is our ability to discern not just that total, but how much of the total is ejected and how much of it remains in the cell casing and is conducted away through the cell casing. Um, so the table below shows you uh what uh we're looking at in this particular uh presentation um okay a very interesting email nonetheless uh so we're looking at a, a variety of cells here so uh what i did is, is this is actually a subset of results we presented uh earlier in november and uh if you're interested in that presentation you're welcome to reach out but uh, using the battery failure data bank we were able to analyze the lg m50 uh, which is 21700, the cooler 21700, K500, the SAF D cell, um, which is kind of a big fat cell, uh, cylindrical as well. And then the cooler 18650, K330. So with capacities ranging from kind of that 3435 amp hours on up to 5 amp hour. Uh, and what we were able to see is, you know, for the 18650 format cell, um, you, you didn't see a whole lot of difference as a, as a function of your trigger mechanism, right? So uh, your heater ISC average uh, was within the noise or standard deviation of your heater non-ISC, right? You can see that uh, with the average total energy yield at the bottom of this plot. Um, so, for example, uh, the heater ISC results, the average was uh, 59.56 kilojoules of energy release uh, compared to an average of 61.2 kilojoules release when we would trigger it with heaters without an ISC. And so what that should tell you is that for this particular cell build, um, it, it seemed to be agnostic of, of whatever trigger mechanism that you're using. But then we started seeing something interesting uh, when we started looking at, at the same comparison, but for some of our larger cells. For our larger cells, uh, the M50, the K500, and the BES16, we saw that not only was nail penetration uh, tending to, uh, well, essentially tick the cells off uh, more, uh, but it, it was orders of magnitude more. So what you see with those three cell types is that we were able to, to evaluate or, or to, to discern that uh, triggering these cells uh, with a nail as opposed to heat uh, tended to result um, in, in a significantly more heat output uh, when the cell would explode. So in the case of the M50, you're looking at an average of 98.3 kilojoules. Uh, the K500, you're looking at 96.4 kilojoules. Uh, and for the VES16, you're looking at an average of 89.6 kilojoules. Um, so just kind of from a global perspective here, we're seeing that the smaller cells uh, tend to have comparable amount of thermal energy released due to thermal runaway, uh, regardless of the triggering mechanism. Uh, but when we start evaluating some of these larger cells, uh, we, we don't see that trend. And so when you have a calorimeter, uh, like what we have here, uh, and you're able to do rapid turnaround testing, as Jacob was describing, you're able to uh, conduct a statistically significant number of, uh, of experiments, of samples, right? And then you can take those samples and characterize the overall range uh, of thermal runaway output, and then you can look at these averages, and you can start getting some perspective on, okay, this is what we experienced on a specific test, and how that test compares to a global set of results. So that's the average total energy release. Uh, I think I also have another chart on total energy release. Can we go to the next uh, chart? Um, yeah, so so this uh, kind of hits on uh, what I was just saying there is, is you know, it, sometimes it's helpful not to look at thermal runaway as just this singular value, but rather a, uh, a range uh, of possible or expected outcomes. So this is a plot that we extracted from one of our recent publications uh, in Journal of Power Sources, which just recently became uh, an open access article, uh, where we're comparing uh, the range of heat output for a variety of cells that you see here, right? So you've got the Molly J, uh, the HG2, the 30Q, uh, the LGM36, uh, the Murata VC7, and the LGMJ1, right? So all commercial cells. Uh, and we're able to compare the range uh, of total heat output as well uh, as the likelihood of one event to occur over another. And, and that's helpful when you're trying to compare, uh, you know, uh, a higher energy cell to a lower energy cell. Some of the trends we started seeing, uh, uh, the higher energy cells tended to have higher standard deviations than the lower energy cells on a, on a total heat output basis. 
Uh, and uh, But then you, you start to have some poke outs though. So for example, the Murata VC7, another very high energy cell. Uh, and yet uh, we we had a pretty pretty tight standard deviation with this cell, significantly more so, or significantly tighter, I should say, than, than the MJ1, even though uh, the capacity was similar. Uh, and it also had less heat output, despite the fact that it was uh, uh, of similar capacity. And, and these are important tools uh, that customers can use when they're in that cell selection process, that battery pack design process, that thermal management design process, right? These are tools that you can use in that process to determine uh, what cell you should select uh, given a design that you are trying to satisfy. Next slide, please. So uh, then there's the fractional energy release. So the calculated energy fractions uh, are essentially traceable to every uh, assembly, sub-assembly, and individual component. So what the uh, plot in, in the middle shows is the red being the cell chamber assembly uh, and the cell body fraction, the uh, blue or indigo uh, being the positive ejecta, and the black being the negative ejecta. And what we're showing here is that uh, the innermost ring, we can track in terms of just the global fraction. What is the cell body fraction? What was the positive side ejective fraction? Uh, and what was the negative side fraction? But if we needed to, we could also break that down into, well, what sub-assembly of the calorimeter was driving that part of the calculation? Or if we needed to go even further to the outermost ring, we could analyze based on a component basis. So which specific components are driving the calculation more for a given experiment? Uh, so uh, this is just kind of a, to help you understand uh, what goes into the fractional calculations and how we determine those cell body heating rate, uh, cell body heat versus uh, ejected heat. Next slide, please. So uh, for the same cells that we were looking at with the with, with the average uh, total energy release, these are the same cells, the same trigger mechanisms, uh, looking at the average uh, energy fractions, right? So the cooler cells and the LGM50, those are all bottom bent cells, which is why uh, you see the uh, the split uh, the way you do such ne heavy negative side behavior, uh, but then you start getting more interesting insights uh, when you compare a bottom bent cell to another bottom bent cell. So, for example, comparing the M50 to the cooler K500, uh, and for whatever reason, the M50 tended to have uh, heavier negative side activity. So, on the order of 50% uh, for heater experiments, and on the order of 60% for nail penetration experiments, compared to the cooler 21700, where uh, it, give or take, was very close to a, a third, third, third split. Um, other findings we were seeing, uh, 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 with the exception of, uh, I believe it was the M50, um, we tended to have a increased fraction of the energy released through the cell body for nail penetration experiments. In general, we think that could do, be due to the fact that the nail is uh, essentially impinging the uh, the jelly roll or the electrode winding and trapping it inside the cell casing, which subsequently results in more heat being released through the cell casing. But this, this is a very uh, uh, small uh, uh, finding thus far. Uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, and this is brand new. Uh, you know, if you're a thermal analyst like me, so I grew up, you know, building models before I came into the battery world and started working with Eric and Jacob's team. Uh, and when you build a thermal model of, of anything and you need to apply a heat load um, you, and you're doing transient analysis, well, you need to know the transient heat rate profile, right? Okay, it's great to understand the total heat, but if I want to model that, what is my time constant? What is my heat flux when I put that in my model? And so what we've been doing is working to extrapolate time constants from the calorimeter that we can then couple with the energy calculations to discern uh, what the overall heat rates are. Um, so right now, uh, this is uh, very much proof of concept. We're, we're extracting uh, what we think could be the shortest length of the event, what we think could be the longest length of the event, what we think might be uh, a, an average if we look at both of those, and then coupling those with total energy yield uh, to, to see what we see. And uh, we're starting to see, uh, when, when we exclude some of the outliers, uh, we're actually starting to see uh, heat rates that are comparable uh, to what... Uh, to what is uh, reported in literature. And so I'm hopeful that in the very near future, we'll be able to modify our output file and modify our calculation algorithm to also spit out data like what you see here, uh, which is the heat rate, right? So uh, joules per second heat rate. Next slide, please. All right, well, thank you, Will.
Thanks. That, that was a great uh, summary of the results, the type of results we'll get. Now we'll go into how we can couple this with uh, high-speed X-ray videography. And we're able to do this by going to these uh, synchrotrons. So you've been able to, two European ones have been able to accept us with uh, our hazardous experiment. And thanks to the containment that's provided by the uh, calorimeter, we're able to convince them that we can run these multiple experiments uh, in a four-day period quickly and safely. So they accelerate the huge photons uh, flux of light the, and, and able to get X-ray videography at super high speed, all the way up to 20,000 frames per second. If you limit the field of view, you're able to discern the phases of how a cell ejects its jelly roll, for example, here. As you can see, the unwinding of the, um, let me move to the next chart. Yeah, as you can see, the unwinding of the crimp seal, the um, uh, folding of the spin groove, and, and so forth. So you can get uh, a lot of uh, insight, particularly the obvious one here, that, that this cell generates a lot of gas pressure that's behind the jelly roll. It sure would be nice to be able to relieve that pressure um, by putting some other vent mechanism. And this uh, made us look at uh, bottom vent cells. We started looking at characterizing these types of failure modes from cells that uh, vent and blow their top to cells that uh, burst their bottom burst disc to cells that have spin groove failures to cells that have the, the most pernicious failure, the uh, sidewall rupture, as you can see over here. Um, and here's a little smaller uh, side breach that can occur. And then here's a bottom breach. So we endeavor to analyze that and see the impact of where this is, if the short occurs in different locations inside the jelly roll, how does that impact uh, the, the, the failure mode? And so we use our internal short circuit device uh, and put it in various places near the top or near the middle, near the bottom, three or four winds into the jelly roll. The device um, activates a short, hard short circuit when the wax melts in the device at 57 degrees. We don't have to heat the cell very much. And we're able to put a wrist map. And uh, Donald Finnegan, a colleague at NREL, was able to publish this and basically showed that uh, if you put the device near the bottom, you're going to have a lot more bottom ejecta activity. You put it towards the top, it's going to impact uh, the top. And, and also, you uh, much more likely to have a sidewall breach that's clocked with the device, um, depending on where you put that device. And we're able to also couple this with the results from that Will puts together in terms of the probability distribution. So we can see that uh, near, if you put the device near the top, um, you'll, you'll get different fractional distributions of the heat. As you can see here, even on the, a cell that doesn't have a bottom vent, you'll get some bottom ruptures if you put the device near the bottom. So my take home messages here, um, one of the main ones that uh, Will showed you in that one plot with the probability distributions, the multiple cell designs, is that the thermal runaway heat output is so weakly correlated to the electrical energy. So you can't just put a fudge factor um, and uh, correlate that to the amp hours or the watt hours of a cell, which basically means we need to test uh, each cell design that we uh, plan to implement into a battery design if we want to optimize that battery design. We have found that bottom vents and thicker steel cans uh, tend to reduce the violence of a thermal runway. Uh, we've actually seen the, the post-test masses to be greater in those cells, which is a bit counterintuitive. Um, because now you're blowing out both ends, but the uh, vent seems to happen at lower pressure and uh, at, uh, with less residence time. And then uh, we've also seen that the different trigger techniques impact uh, the total heat and the heat distribution. Uh, with the 18650, with the um, designs that we've tested so far, um, we have not seen much of a difference, but we see that difference more pronounced with the larger cells in that the nail pen seems to provide a, a bigger heat output than the other two techniques. But the other main message to give you from this uh, presentation is that our tool is uh, well matured, as we showed you through 11 generations, 
were able to do uh, in a 96 hour uh, synchrotron test or window, beam time window, uh, nearly 100 uh, runs. And so the, uh, the design is uh, optimized to be able to fully characterize the cell um, design by doing multiple runs since uh, not every cell, does, uh, not every thermal runaway event is the same as you can see in that, that one plot. So now I think I will turn it over. Um, well, here's, I have a list of references if you want to dig in deeper into this. And then I will turn it over to Chip. Thanks, guys. So thank you to all of our presenters today, our behind the scenes support, John Sullivan, and mostly thanks to everyone out there for sharing your valuable time with us today. We truly appreciate your interest in NASA and its technology transfer programs. Bye now. <laughs>